I would say the three three main, if I can name three, three yeah. main th three main mysteries of the show. Number one, how were the images formed? Number two, why did the carbon date uh, the shroud to the Middle Ages? Number three, how did the blood that dried on the body get onto the cloth? Very interesting concepts, and I think all three could be related. If there is one mystery that's fascinated both theologists and scientists around the world equally, it would have to be the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud, with its mysterious origins, was discovered to bear the imprint of a man who seemingly died from crucifixion on it, with many believing the face to be that of Jesus. Skeptics argue that the face was created by con artists, but it's been proved time and time again that the face on the shroud is genuine. But what happens when a nuclear engineer with over 40 years of experience steps onto the scene and uses the latest technology to settle the matter once and for all? Let's find out together what Bob Rucker has to say about the Shroud of Turin. It's interesting if I could give you a little bit of background how I became interested yeah. in it. Uh, when, when I was young, you know, uh, I, I don't know, I, I, 10 or 12, 12, 13 years old, I was delivering newspapers on Sunday morning. I'd come home early before everyone else was up. So I was flipping through the newspaper, and at that time, in the newspaper was a, a, a paper magazine called Parade. Uh, and I was just flipping through that, and, and uh, I found a little picture here, maybe an in inch and a quarter inch and a half high, uh, just of the face on the Shroud of Turin. I never was not aware of it at all at that point. But then, you know, it was a fuzzy picture. I didn't know what it, what it was. It kind of looked like a face. But then off to the right, uh, there was three or four sentences. And, and the last sentence said that a lot of people think that this is a, the actual burial cloth of Jesus. And I thought, well, that can't be. I mean, if, if that were true, then everyone would know it. It would be so highly revered, so highly recognized. Why would any... Bob Rocker is a man of science and has dedicated himself to the scientific discipline of nuclear physics. There is one thing that's fascinated him more than nuclear physics ever since he was a small child, and it's the Shroud of Turin. Rocker's attention was drawn to the Shroud of Turin when he saw a picture of it in the newspaper when he was a young boy, and it is from there that his obsession with that cloth that claimed to have housed the body of Christ started. But what really is the Shroud of Turin? Where does it find its origins from? And why does everyone believe that the image that's been formed on it was indeed that of Christ? Well, to understand that, we have to look at the history of the cloth and how it had been passed down from generation to generation. Let's hear Bob himself explain it. If you wanted to show the Shroud of Turin, what we now call the Shroud of Turin, if you wanted to show that, in your own church, you'd come to where it was and make a copy of it by painting it on a copy. Mm. So then that that's how the, the whole focus on relics started in the Catholic Church, because there were relics that were authentic. Okay, now, now, and, and then, uh, you know, I think a lot of the, what they call relics or icons are probably not authentic, but some are, and this is the one in particular that is authentic. We can see that Bob himself is a firm believer in God and the authenticity of the Shroud of Turin. What he is saying is absolutely right as well. Back in the old days, travel wasn't as common, and it was rather uncommon for people to be traveling to places to see relics. So what the church would do instead is that they would create replicas of the relics they had and send them out to the other churches so people everywhere would be able to see the relic. There was initial concern that the Shroud of Turin that was housed in the Chapel of Turin was one such replica, but several scientific tests have proved that this is indeed the original one. The Shroud, like Bob said, eventually landed in the chapel at Turin in Italy, but before that, it was passed down between houses and could be traced all the way back to the 14th century, where a king by the name of Geoffrey de Charnay handed the shroud to the House of Savoy as a gift of goodwill. But the shroud, which was only claimed to be the burial cloth of Christ, would get visual proof of this claim in 1898. How did the cloth really confirm that it had housed the body of Christ? 
Well, this was proved when a photographer by the name of Secando Pier took pictures of the shroud for the first time in history. When he eventually developed the negatives of the image, he noticed that there was an image of the full body of a man imprinted on the cloth. And on closer inspection, it seemed like this man had died by crucifixion and even had severe traumatic bruising around his head, which was consistent with damage from a crown of thorns. But now let's hear from Bob as to how he believes the image on the Shroud of Turin was formed. Uh, because if the Shroud is the authentic burial cloth of Jesus, and the images were made by a burst of radiation from the body, which I believe most uh, Shroud researchers believe today, uh, if the images were made by a burst of radiation from the body, how does that happen? Well, dead bodies don't emit such a burst of radiation. That would only occur uh, if Jesus was resurrected from the dead so that the atoms in his body disappeared from the per our perception uh, of reality uh, and made a transition to an alternate dimensionality. In physics terminology, that's what I would call it. Layman might call it heaven, but that's okay. Uh, I'd call it an alternate dimensionality. We can see that a majority of the scientific community who believes in the authenticity of the Shroud has accepted that the image on the Shroud was probably formed by a burst of radiation that was emitted from the body of Christ at the moment of his resurrection. Bob even goes so far as to state that he believes that this burst of radiation occurred due to the atoms of Christ's body undergoing a transition between two dimensional planes between heaven and earth. This falls in line with all the scientific research that's been conducted on the Shroud as well. We can see that back in the 70s, a group of individuals gathered together and undertook what was one of the most comprehensive efforts to study the Shroud of Turin. And what they had discovered is that the imprint on the cloth was clearly not fabricated, as the imprint was only present on the surface of the cloth and did not penetrate into the deeper fibers even a bit. They realized at that moment that the kind of energy that would be needed to fabricate an imprint of that size would be around 6.4 gigawatts. And there sure wasn't any power source 2000 years ago that could produce such levels of energy other than the power of God. Now let's hear from Bob as to how he believes the image formed on the shroud. Uh, when I model uh, the shroud of Turin for nuclear analysis, what I'm modeling, I model a human body in uh, just simple geometrical shapes. I actually use eight different shapes, uh, uh, cuboids, or, or uh, like pyramid, uh, cut pyramid shapes uh, right. to, to model the body. And, and then around it, I, I put uh, a rectangular box all the way down of very thin linen to make it easy to model how the shroud was, was located around the body. Uh, and then I placed that into uh, a limestone tomb as it would have been uh, produced in first century uh, Jerusalem, um, based upon archaeologist recommendations. So I, I model uh, a back bench, a left bench, a right bench, uh, a rolling stone in front of the entrance, uh, and then I, I put uh, one meter of limestone below the tomb to the right and left of the tomb and to the back of the tomb and above the tomb. Um, the front wall I may make uh, thinner, uh, but that's my model and I'll, I can show pictures of my model. We can see that for the purposes of conducting his own tests on the Shroud of Turin, Bob had gone all out and produced a simulation of the resurrection that would have taken place based off the passages that are available to us, and he ran a test that would have allowed him to see what exactly the resurrection would have been like. And the results that he received were amazing. It confirmed that the shroud would have indeed gotten such an imprint, given that all the conditions that they had hypothesized about came to be. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Bob reckons that much of the proofs that had been released through the years in an attempt to debunk the Shroud of Turin actually tells only half the picture, while the other half proves that the Shroud of Turin is indeed real 
and one such proof is the radiocarbon dating that was conducted by another group of scientists after the STIRP project had concluded. They had come to the conclusion that the cloth was not from the time of Christ, but rather from the 1300s, which would be right around the time the shroud showed up for the first time. They had arrived at this conclusion by doing carbon-14 radio dating. But Bob says that this is only half of the full picture, as there are many things that they purposefully left out while calculating the radiocarbon dating. Rucker says that while the readings that the scientists received were accurate, there was a reason why the cloth showed a much younger origin date than expected. This is due to a phenomenon called neutron absorption, which would have occurred at the time of the resurrection, causing the false positive to occur when dating the cloth. The, the carbon date uh, from the three different laboratories is not consistent with one another. It's statistically inconsistent, and that can be shown. Uh, and so you have to ask, why? Why is it that I if you move the sample point by about that much, you get a different date? Why is that? Well, it turns out that, that the rate of change is about 36 years per centimeter, or 91 years per inch. Well, so, uh, the, the shroud according to carbon, the mean carbon date or average carbon date was about 1260. So if you move the sample point at that rate, about 10 inches, you would change the date by 910 years, more recent. So you take 1260 plus 910 years, you end up with, you get a date of 2170 AD. That's to the future. So that's when you know we can see another very important fact when it comes to the radiocarbon dating. The fact that the three lab tests that had independently conducted the tests all came back with different results, although they had used the same piece of cloth. Furthermore, there was a difference of 91 years for every centimeter they moved ahead in the graph, which was purposefully ignored, but if they had added up the concurrent years, they would have received a figure that was somewhere close to the original expected date. The image formation also shows no imprints of the side of the body, which would be explained by the neutron radiation theory, which states that the image that was formed in the cloth was by the vertical oscillation of nuclei in the body, which then emitted protons that formed the image and neutrons that shifted the carbon-14 levels. There have been several other tests that have been conducted on the Shroud of Turin as well, like the Wide Angle X-ray Test, or WASP for shot, which examined the deterioration rate of the linen and returned results that are consistent with the original dates obtained by the STIRP team. The Shroud of Turin remains as one of the greatest relics of the ancient world, as it brings together the past, present and future.